Welcome and good evening, everyone. My name is Jessica Drench and I'm Executive Director of 826 Boston, coming to you live from our Writing and Tutoring Center in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Normally, this place is bustling with students and staff during evening tutoring, but tonight it's just me, ready to lead you through our first ever virtual program to benefit 826 Boston. We should wrap up in less than 45 minutes, and we also understand that we're all operating on different schedules these days. So if you need to leave early, we want to make sure you know how to give. You can text 826BOSTON, one word, no space, to the number 44321, or you can go to 826boston.org slash hope. And we'll make sure to keep that info front and center throughout the event. One last piece of tech housekeeping before we get started. I'm told that the program will be optimized if you set your computer to full screen. So please go ahead and do that now. For those of you who are new to us this evening, 826 Boston is a youth writing and publishing nonprofit that empowers traditionally underserved students ages 6 to 18 to find their voices, tell their stories, and gain communication skills to succeed in school and in life. We are part of the 826 National Network of Youth Writing Centers, co-founded by author Dave Eggers and educator Nina Vey Caligari. 826 Boston's programs, free to students and families, serve 5,000 students annually and provide 30,000 hours of writing support each year. I'll be talking more about our work, how we've been serving our students through the current crisis, and how you can help later on in the program. But first, we're excited to kick this evening off with our special guests. Jenny Slate is an actress, author, and stand-up comedian who hails from Milton, Mass, and is the New York Times bestselling author of the children's book, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. She has provided the voices for many characters in animated films, including The Secret Life of Pets, Despicable Me, Zootopia, and the Lego Batman movie, and is known for her roles in shows and movies, including Bob's Burgers, Kroll's Show, and the 2014 Sundance film, Obvious Child. Very notably to her fans, Jenny played the unparalleled character of Mona Lisa Saperstein in one of my favorite shows, Parks and Recreation. Jenny is a graduate of Columbia University. Her most recent book, Little Weirds, came out in November 2019. And we can think of no better person to be in conversation with our special guest than Jennifer DeLeon. Jen is an assistant professor of creative writing at Framingham State University and a Grub Street instructor and board member. She's the editor of Wise Latinas, Writers on Higher Education, and has published prose in over a dozen literary journals, including Plowshares, Iowa Review, and Michigan Quarterly Review. Jen is also a former teacher in the Boston Public Schools, and it was an absolute joy to partner with her back in 2013 on the 826 Boston publication, Things Will Get Better and More Delicious. And with that, I hand it over to my friend, Jen. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jenny. Jen. Hi, everybody. This is so exciting, and it's such an honor to be in conversation with you. Um, I have a gazillion questions, but I'm going to like rein myself in <laughs> and um, just kind of get get going here. I mean, I think I would love to know, and I think everyone else would just love to know how you got started um, with the arts, your career, with writing and acting and, and doing voice work. It's just so exciting. Um, well, I think I got started with my career by following um, the feelings that I, I had as a child. Um, I think some people um, discover that they want to do art or live a creative life, be a creator like later on in their life. But um, I, I can't explain why, but I am one of the people that was born understanding that I wanted to be a performer um, and that I wanted to be able to work every day within my imagination and with what I found in there, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, I, I always knew that was what I wanted to do. I had no assurance that I could do it. Um, but every day I kind of followed my feelings. Um, I think if, if you're one of those people that gets a lot of pleasure from being creative and you really feel most like yourself when you're writing or you're dancing or um, painting or whatever your thing is, um, and you feel like, oh, I really, I really see myself, I really feel myself. Um, I think I followed those feelings. And um, after I graduated from college, I just, try to find ways to perform live um, as often as possible because when I could perform live, I felt like I was being really honest about who I was and um, that gave me a lot of confidence. That's so beautiful. Oh my goodness. Um, and you know, 
I was I was reading um, different interviews that you've done and talks and, and you know, I'm a huge fan and I love your work and I just was cracking up like rewatching some of these clips and everything and it's just so great. Mm -hmm. um, but I, in, in one interview, you mentioned that you use writing as a way of getting to know yourself again and that I just thought that was such um, just a great quote to kind of pinpoint what it is that feeling that you get when you go to your art form and, and in this case um, for eight to six students and everyone you know it's writing and so I wondered if you could just share a little bit about that um, what what you meant by that sure I mean I, I think that one of the things about being a person is that um, although you're aware of where you've come from and what are your sort of like most important things that happen to you, um, that the self and how we feel about ourself changes all of the time. And sometimes that can be really scary. Um, and it can feel like a loss if you're like, oh, today I don't really feel like the person who just, who did that great thing two weeks ago. Today I don't, I don't feel that way. Um, and I think for me, um, finding a way to speak to myself every day, the way that like, you know, if you call your grandmother on your, on the phone, you know, who's on the other end, you know, what's your grandmother, you know, the way you want to speak to her, what you would say, and what are the right things for her to hear so that she can be happy and know that you're safe. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I talk to myself in that same way, um, as if I'm someone else, um, and I think like, well, who would I be if I knew who I was <laughs> and, you know, like who, who do I remember? Um, and what would I say to her? Because there are a lot of times that, um, that I feel lost as a person. And so I write a, a lot of times to myself in order to remind myself that there's actually a lot more there than, um, than I feel or than I notice and that it's okay if it's, if it's changing. And then in fact, the the change and the moments in which you change are like the most exciting to sort of observe and harvest if you can um if you can kind of stand the way that it's uncomfortable yeah so like sitting with that discomfort and and dipping into it even to to yeah. draw or, or act i mean um i love that i love that so much and i think so many students will relate to that i mean right now during this pandemic I think a lot of students, most of them, all of them are at home and out of the routine and going to writing as a way of, yeah, getting to know themselves again. I mean, that's their anchor in this period. Um, so what has been your anchor during this um, pandemic? You know, a lot, I, I've been actually, <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of, there can be, um, and for some people it works, but there's a lot of pressure, I think, online and on social media to like make the most out of um, what's happening and, you know, like create something every day. And um, I think for me, my reaction to the fear that I've, that I've felt about things really being disrupted, um, schedules being disrupted, not being able to do the things that we normally do that make us feel like ourselves has sort of flattened me. Mm -hmm. And um, what's been helpful to me is to realize that um, every day is for living, but it is not necessarily to, you know, mark down some sort of major win. And so I think what's been helpful to me is to um, make sure that I write a certain number of pages every day in my journal mm -hmm. and that I have basically no expectations for what that will be. And so sometimes like my journal almost sounds like a seven-year-old writing from camp. And it's just sort of like, I miss my friends. <laughs> I wish I could eat candy on the subway. You know, I mean, it's just nothing. But the fact is that I'll look back on that a year from now and see that I was drained and see that I was still trying to speak. And, and it will mean something to me in the greater picture. So I think what's been helpful to me is to just um, return to the same little notebook every day, even if, even if, um, it's not for anyone to read but myself. And also I've really increased my, my reading. You know, I don't know if you're doing that, but like I, I'm really reading a lot more in an effort to stay um, off of my phone. Yes, <laughs> here I am in front of m one of my bookshelves. And it's funny you mentioned seven-year-old because I have a certain seven-year-old son here. Oh. Oh, he has a question for you. Oh my gosh. I hope that you will take his question. Of course. Okay, here he oh. is. What a cutie. 
Thank you. Say thank you. Thank you. What's your name? Mateo. Hi, Mateo. I'm Jenny. What's your question? Um, is Sesame Street a real street? Oh my gosh. Well, um, I will tell you it's a real place. I've been there. It's not a street on in, uh, in the city, but it is its own little street in a really big building. Ooh. Um, so ca cars can't like drive down it. Um, it's sort of more protected because it's really special. Um, and Big Bird does live there. And oh my God. Woo! Yeah. All right, see, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you just made our like whole month. Okay. Um, Oh, he's, if there's time, he has another question for you. Sure. Um, all right, so now I thought we'd like switch it up and do um, kind of a lightning round of Would You Rather. Have you ever okay. played Would You Rather? Yeah. I'm really good at it. Yeah, okay. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. We got five questions. Okay. Would you rather write in pen or pencil? Pen. Would you rather be too early to a party or too late? Too early. Would you rather wear lipstick or mascara if you had to pick one? Mascara. I know it's hard. Um, okay, if you had to choose one, would you rather have the power to fly or the power to turn invisible? Invisible. Ooh. Oh, okay. No, fly, fly. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> How come? Well, because I just realized that um, I say invisible, but that I wouldn't, I would be nosy and, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't act like you're somewhere you know if nobody knows that you're it's not fair that's not fair <laughs> flying you know the invisible thing it's like that that um that plays on all my weaker parts i would just be like a snoop you know mm -hmm. you don't i don't know that you use invisibility for anything except maybe like light pranks like you know you could be like woo with a vase you know and you know if like scare someone but i don't i think like i mean the chances are i become like a thief yeah you know okay. i I mean, I wouldn't, but yeah, no, flying for sure. For sure. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Would you rather only be able to whisper or only be able to shout? Whisper. Oh. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, I guess it would be weird to shout all the time. All right, last one. Would you rather be a bear or an alligator? I, wow. Uh, I guess a bear. I'd rather be a bear. Okay. Yeah. It's actually, if would you rather wrestle a bear or an alligator? Oh, wrestle a bear oh. or an alligator. I missed that. I, I mean, those those the both seem equally <laughs> scary and equally hard. I yeah. Guess, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't win. So it's really about you know the experience. I guess I'd go for bear, just because yeah. they have fur. Yeah, fur is. At cool. least you get to touch their fur. <laughs> That's good because. Alligators' teeth are hollow, so. Oh, Ooh. fun facts. I didn't even know that. Um, I didn't know it either. So we have a couple other questions from some 826 young people. Um, one is from Ashton, and he wants to know, why do most people like jeans when they're always like, the jeans are so uncomfortable? You know, that's a really good question. I think um, it's got to be for the fit. But also, I mean, so Ashton is Ashton, right? Yeah. So Ashton finds jeans to be uncomfortable. I mean, there's some people that that really don't think they're comfortable. I actually think they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a lot about butts. <laughs> I think it's about how a good pair of jeans makes butts look nice. Yeah, yeah. Depending on what your value system is about what you, a nice butt looks like to you. Exactly, but, yeah. yeah. No, that's a really great answer. Okay, um, Nyla had a question. Um, when you are voice acting, do you connect with your characters and which character did you connect with the most? Um, you can see my <laughs> my fiance walking around in the background. <laughs> yeah, kids, fiance. Five. Um, <laughs> um, I would say yes, um, no matter what I'm doing in a performance, I always connect to the character. That is one of the, greatest pleasures of, of being a performer is uh, connecting to something that is like another, you know, putting yourself in a, in a different version of uh, how to exist. That's really great. And what was the second part is? Um, which character did you connect with the most? Oh, well, you know, 
I think that um, it's, you know, the character of Marcel the Shell is the character that I connect to the most. And, and I created that character. Um, I co-created it um, with Dean Fleischer Camp. But, um, you know, I do that voice and I improvise, I make up what he says. Mm -hmm. And so that comes directly from me. Um, so in a way, being Marcel is more like, is is like being a very private version of myself, um, yeah. a version of myself that's kind of hard to articulate, but I know it's there. And I created that character to, to show that part of how I feel sometimes. Mm -hmm. I love Marcel. Oh my God. I goodness. love that too. Yeah. Oh, um, he created like the pet from a little bit of lint. Yeah. Alan, his lint yeah. dog. Yes. Like yeah. it's genius. So anyway, <laughs> I just think it's so great. Um, now, what advice, if you could give your teenage self advice, um, you know, specifically when it comes to writing, what, what would you say to your younger self? Um, I think that uh, I, I would say, um, try to be as honest as possible um, and imagine that that nobody would ever find this. <laughs> like when, I, I mean, I don't know if that's good advice, but I know that, and who knows, you know, whatever part of your process you're in is probably what's right for you. But when I was a teenager, I was writing um, like in diaries and journals and things like that, hoping that someone would find it. Um, and I wish that I had written, I hope somebody finds this. I wish that I had written, I hope somebody finds this and they know, they understand that I feel this way. Um, rather than sort of writing the opposite of what I felt, hoping that somebody would find it and think I was cool. And maybe the teenagers out there are just like a lot more secure than I was at that time. But, um, you know, I, I, I really was trying to, I thought I was trying to get to, to be so, somewhere else or someone else. And when I look back on it now, like I've always been pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you can if you can get to love the parts of yourself that are there that you see, even the ones that you're not comfortable with, um, you'll really get a head start on understanding what you have to work with. Yes. Because um, you can try to change uh, who you are, but um, there's really no point <laughs> because yeah. your own story is the most interesting and the most beautiful and you're the one who knows, who knows it best. I also feel that way about, you know, doing my stand up. Like nobody could do my jokes because because they're my stories and they're my voice and um I've come to understand that that's the most precious thing that I have. And a lot of times I joke about things that I wish didn't happen to me. Mm -hmm. Um but they're still such valuable experiences. Absolutely. They're part of you. They're part of your story. I love that, that it's like the, the more you go into your, the center, like to yourself, nobody can tell you you're getting it wrong if you're being truthful about who you are. And yeah, yeah, there, there's, there's really no wrong way to do it. Um, I mean, sometimes I write about myself um, and I see myself as an animal or, or I see myself as Marcel the shell and I just find the way to say how I feel. And it might be in it, you know, through what they call magical realism. Mm -hmm. um, but it's about being able to say, I feel this set of feelings. Mm -hmm. They don't feel maybe like they belong in a human woman. They belong in a tiny ageless male shell with <laughs> shoes on, um, but they are here. And if I, if I deny that they belong, I hurt myself and I deny the world of a um, unique story, which is like, you know, what we all need. Yes. Oh my goodness. That's a beautiful way to wrap up. Um, mm. Definitely. We do need these stories and we, and we need them from, from young people, from, from shells, from everybody, all souls. Yes. Um, and we're just so grateful to you for being here and for writing in the world and, and creating in the world. Thank you um, for having me. It's been a real pleasure. And, um, I just want to congratulate all of the young writers out there for, for putting your voices yeah. uh, out and, um, and like we all really benefit from it. And yeah. um, whatever you have to say is worth it and beautiful. Yes, whether you write in pen or pencil. That's right, want to hear I it. a pen, but that's just me. <laughs> we'll send you a pen, we'll send you an 826 pen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, I, I think Jess is going to take it from here. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much to our special guests, including, no, especially Mateo, and for sharing your insights and helping us all feel even more connected tonight. I also feel better about my seven-year-old style journal entries these days. Special thanks again to Jenny Slate for making time to join her many fans here at our event this evening. And we hope that you will all keep an eye out for Jen DeLeon's de debut young adult novel, Don't Ask Me Where I'm From, when it comes out in August, which best-selling author of Little Fires Everywhere, Celeste Ng calls a funny, perceptive, and much-needed book telling a much-needed story. Jen and Jenny have touched on why writing and storytelling are so important at this unprecedented time. And I'm going to take a few minutes now to tell you a bit more about A26 Boston before sharing tonight's short and powerful film. At A26 Boston, we believe that strong writing skills are critical to success and we're dedicated to spotlighting some of the most marginalized voices in our city, predominantly students of color from low income communities, many from immigrant families. Our talented team works to ensure that the stories of our students are heard each and every day. A26 Boston typically provides writing and tutoring programs here at our center and in partner schools. As part of our strategic plan, we opened five more writers rooms in the past five years for a total of six full-time in-school programs. And this network of writers rooms in the Boston Public Schools centers the voices of students from across the city connects youth to one another through publishing and transforms the culture of writing within school communities. On March 13th, when we announced that we were pausing all in-person programming due to the COVID-19 outbreak, one of the first things that our team did was to reach out to families, partner teachers and school leaders and ask, how can we help? Their responses built the foundation for our digital plan that is currently serving our community. Over the past two months, we've shifted all of our programs to a digital delivery. The writer's rooms are offering their services online from one-to-one -one tutoring and office hours for personal check-ins with students to feedback on student papers and creative writing clubs. More than a dozen classroom book projects that had launched prior to our move to remote work will still be published. In the after-school program, students are receiving remote support with their teacher assigned projects and digital care packages that our team is sending home for their families every week. During April break, our creative writing workshop program included offerings from team storytelling to at-home puppet theater. Every workshop was full. Over these past 10 weeks, we've served 400 students and provided more than 1,700 hours of free tutoring. And we're just getting started in this era that has called on all of us to innovate, create, and connect in new and meaningful ways. These hours that are dedicated to connection with our students have taken on tremendous meaning and purpose in the current crisis. The disparities that existed in the community that we served before the pandemic, access to medical care, mental health support and technology, food and job insecurity, and equitable opportunities in education have been painfully magnified. And a disproportionate number of COVID cases and deaths have been reported in communities of color. Boston students are inundated with media that reflects these realities and our country's entrenched problems with social injustice, divisive rhetoric, and systemic racism. Now more than ever, the support of trusting adults who can offer trauma-informed approaches and direct instruction are vital. While all schools in Massachusetts have moved to remote learning, the opportunity gap is getting even wider as a result of this crisis. A study in late April showed that 50% of students in the Boston Public Schools have been logging on to remote programs compared to 95% of students in the nearby suburban Andover Public School District. The front line in this crisis to support youth and ensure that they have the resources to navigate such uncertain terrain include the teachers, mentors, and advocates who are working to address these glaring inequities. At 26 Boston, we're anticipating a period of learning loss for our students and are fully dedicated to supporting them through it, both in and out of school. We exist to equip and empower young people with skills and confidence to communicate effectively, to safely explore their creativity, and to foster stories of resilience and hope. On that note, it's time to introduce this evening's film directed by Matt Watson. Those of you who are familiar with 26 Boston events know that one of the highlights each year are Matt's extraordinary films that amplify the inspiring voices of A26 Boston students. Tonight, we feature Asia and A26 Boston's Youth Literary Advisory Board, known as YLAB, which represents students from all of A26 Boston's programs. YLAB has continued to meet weekly on Zoom with Writers Room Director, Nakia Hill, 
and is currently collecting student submissions for a citywide anthology of pieces on the topics of self-identity and empowerment in the pandemic. Let's cue the film. All right, we're rolling. <laughs> Mi casa is breathed to life by a thousand songs, a thousand ancestors, a mosaic of mimicry. Mi casa canta debajo de la luna llena. She is full of stories, intricate, detailed like the handiwork of our quilts. Tiene ojos de obsidiana, tan oscuros, pero tan brillantes. My name is Asia. I am 18 years old and I live in Boston. I've lived in Boston like my whole life. I've actually lived in the same house my whole life. I have five siblings, um, a lot of siblings. <laughs> I'm the oldest. My mom's side of the family calls me Asi and I hate that nickname. I hated it so much growing up that I was like, please stop calling me that. I actually disliked my name too, but I then learned what my name meant. In the Quran, Asya is the wife of Pharaoh in the story of Moses, and her name means one who tends the weak. That's kind of like what I wanted to do like when I grew, grew up, and I was like, oh, you guys actually kind of like picked the perfect name for me. <laughs> I actually kind of like, like this now. <laughs> she sings about the North Star, she sings about freedom, she sings about the sage and Aluna, her love of the earth beneath the blue bowl of the sky. Yo soy mi propio casa, mi cuerpo que proteja mi corazón, my body that has the strength of every ancestor. My dad is Colombian, uh, my mom is African American, she also has some Japanese blood, and my dad also has some Native American blood. So it's a whole mix. Growing up, I didn't always feel that connection to, to my cultures as much. And so when I started writing like poetry specifically, I realized that it was such a great medium for me to connect to it in a way. YLab is a space of limitless expression for teenagers. It really is just like a safe space. It's a family and it's about creating things and paving new paths and trying new things, starting new projects, doing things differently than they've been done before. We all like have our own thing that we're like really interested in, but we're all here because we enjoy writing. We're all here because we think self-identity is important. Identity is important now because I think people are sort of turning back to themselves a lot during this time and thinking about what does my identity mean? Like maybe you didn't have time to think about that beforehand. Growing up, I felt like Latinos don't look like me. I'm not really Hispanic. That's what people told me. That's how I felt. I never saw another like Hispanic person who had the same like skin color as me or had the same hair as me or whatever. The surprising part was for me to like discover that, oh, that's actually wrong. Like I've actually learned this sort of stereotype and ingrained it into me and it's actually wrong. And there are plenty of people who are like me and we're learning how to make space for those people, learning how to give those people voices so that they can talk about their narrative, which is also equally as important. This project is really about giving teenagers a positive, healthy coping mechanism slash outlet to release emotions. And I think that writing is often overlooked as something that can be like a healthy coping mechanism. YLab is made up of so many different people with so many different backgrounds. But we're here to make a difference. We're here because we think this is important. And we want other people to also think this is important. My body is a map of history. My veins are paths weathered to be born under a full moon so every phase could be reborn within my soul. Their houses have found a home within me again, breathed into my soul, turned old, and to love me, to love myself, is to love my body, this house of grand memories, of historias y cantos de dolores y amor. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> Not bad at all.
amazing. I'm ready, as always, for Matt's films. Thank you so much to Asia, to her fellow YLA members, and to filmmaker Matt Watson. Um, we also understand that a few folks might have had technical difficulties and were unable to view the film. And we will be sure um, to share the film and follow up after the event so you'll be able to, to watch it at another time. Um, thank you again. In person or remotely, A26 Boston will continue to stand by our students. And tonight, we rely on the support of individual donors to make it happen. This evening, we're asking you to join us by making a financial contribution, whether you've supported our work before or you're brand new to A26 Boston. And I'd like to now invite Kristen Borelli, A26 Boston Stellar Director of Advancement, to talk about how you can get involved. Hi, hello, everybody. Um, well, as many of you know, during the pandemic, Age of Six Boston, like so many nonprofits, um, had to cancel all of our spring in-person fundraisers, including our annual gala, which was originally scheduled for tonight, and normally raises the critical funds we need to run our programs, free of charge to students and families. Um, we launched, we had to get creative when we had to cancel our event, so instead we launched the Hope, Creativity, and Resilience campaign with the goal of raising $200,000 to fuel H6 Boston's programs this spring and into the fall. We are way more than halfway to our goal. As we speak, we have raised $140,000 in counting, and tonight um, we are also excited to share that we have a match. If we can raise $10,000 more in new and increased gifts, uh, a general stoner will match that. And the stoner happens to be a volunteer also, which is even more special for us. Um, so can you help get us the rest of the way tonight? Your gift will go twice as far. Um, so how can you give, you ask? You can do so online at 826boston.org slash hope, which so many of you already have. You can text 826boston, no spaces, all one word, to 44321. Um, and also, I just want to thank you. So many of you have already given tonight and more than once during the spring. Um, some people have given three or four times. It's amazing. So thank you. Um, and if you do choose to support us, which we hope you do, um, we wanted to share a little bit about where your money will go. So we have the $8,260 level, and that will help us support um, the creation of a, a young author's book project, which is a professionally designed book, which you could have seen in the background with, uh, of Jess's talk. Um, this is written by students over several months, an entire class of students. And this year, seventh graders from the uh, Lila Frederick Middle School wrote, um, we hope you'll visit a guide to their Dorchester neighborhood. And the foreword was penned by Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. So stay tuned for that coming out. Um, at the $2,500 level, you can help support our summer college essay boot camp, which we are running this summer remotely. Um, it will help support rising seniors to write their college essays at a time when it's really hard for them to get that individualized support at school. At the $1,000 level, we will, you will help keep the youth literary advisory board going. You saw them tonight in the film. Um, your support will help make sure that these leaders can continue to work with us. Um, and that we can keep investing in their leadership in the year to come. And at the $500 level, you will help us underwrite creative writing um, on Creative Writing Club at one of our six writers rooms in Boston Public Schools. Um, even this spring, during this remote period of working, um, we've launched several new after school creative clubs, including the Music Appreciation Club and others. Um, and at the $250 level, it will help us stay stocked with cleaning supplies when we return and we can keep our writing center and spaces safe for students, staff, volunteers, and families. Um, you're, of course, welcome to support at any level, higher or lower. Any amount is really appreciated. So thank you so much. We're so grateful for all of your gifts. Now I'll turn it back over to Jess. Thanks, Kristen. And thank you all for tuning in and showing your support tonight. In closing, we'd like to thank some very special people, starting with our board members, for their leadership and profound generosity. Their support through the pandemic has been inspiring, energizing, and critical to our ability to continue on. Thank you also for the financial support from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, Fiduciary Trust, Nellie May Education Foundation, the Boston Globe, and Amundi Pioneer for sponsoring this event. We also have some institutional supporters who have stepped up and provided additional funding and added flexibility during these tough times. They include the Cummings Foundation, Mass Humanities, Massachusetts Service Alliance, Elsevier, Hestia Fund, the Great Expectations Fund of the Cape Cod Community Foundation, Northeastern University, Liberty Mutual Foundation, Mass Cultural Council, Q Division Studios, 
Carol Remick Charitable Foundation, Ramsey McCluskey Family Foundation, and Wellington Management Foundation. Lots to be grateful for. And finally, one more very special thank you to the incredible 826 Boston staff and AmeriCorps service members who have kept this train on track and kept our students, families, and partner schools front of mind every step of the way. We'll leave the donation screen up for a little while longer. Good night. Thank you again for coming and stay well and stay safe, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.